Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study here on Judges. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful once again to be able to study together, even though we live far apart. We just ask, Lord, that you can unite our hearts and minds through thy spirit as we open your word together. May you guide and teach us. <clears throat> May you also <clears throat> help us in our day-to-day -day struggles, not just in understanding truth, but in the battles that we face with self. And we just ask, Lord, that you can help us. Uh, to reflect your character to all that we come in contact. Be with us now and all those who are, are following these studies online, uh, that we may understand more of your word, that we can be prepared for the things ahead. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. Um, <clears throat> Just a note, um, you know, about what's been happening here in this building that we're in. Uh, we're going to be starting group Bible studies just for anybody in the building, uh, starting on Fridays at three o'clock in the afternoon for an hour. So it, I'd appreciate people's prayers in that regard. <clears throat> um, we also are going to have some studies with others uh, in there. Well, in their either their apartments or our apartment, so private, more private studies. One lady we had lunch with yesterday. She she wants to study uh, the Book of Revelation with us. So, uh, so it's it's pretty interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> so when we were uh, uh, going through this yesterday, I brought up, of course, these. Um, <clears throat> these timelines. And I, I looked at a point uh, that I want to go over first. And this has to do with the Passovers and the, the wave sheaf offering. Because I went through it rather quick, quickly, and I'm sure not everybody fully grasped what I was saying. Um, <clears throat> and even if you did, it, it's good to go over it again. Now, <clears throat> Uh, the problem arises in Leviticus 23, where there are different interpretations of how to understand this passage. <clears throat> so we can see, of course, these are the, the chapter dealing with all the feasts, uh, the annual feasts. And um, it's going to start with, of course, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and then it's going to deal with the Passover. <clears throat> And then the Feast of First Fruits. Now, when we had looked at um, the story of Joshua and they had crossed uh, the, uh, the Jordan River, they're going to keep the Passover. Now, the last time that they had kept the Passover prior to that was one year after um, leaving Egypt. So there is the, the Passover when they left Egypt, and then there's the Passover um, uh, when uh, they, they celebrate that. And, and in, in that Passover, they're also going to mention uh, the Passover in the second month. I don't know if people uh, remember that. I'm trying to find the verses here. Because uh, uh, I can't remember the wording. Uh, maybe I can find it this way. <clears throat> okay, so in, in uh, well, if we go to Numbers 1.1, 1, 1, uh, maybe we'll go there. Um, I don't know if it's here or not. So they're going to do this census of, this is going to be the census. So I don't think this is quite where I wanted it. 
Um, so I don't think this is the one I want. Um, hmm. Because they're going to have the Passover in the second month. So. Are you talking about numbers 9, 9 to 13? Okay, maybe that's where it is. Um, okay, yeah. So I just wanted to touch on this a little bit. Uh, so the 14th day of the second month at evening, they shall keep it and eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That's numbers 9, 11. So, so the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year that they were come out of the land of Egypt. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at this appointed season. In the 14th day of the month at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season, according to all the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at even, well, I see why I didn't find it. It was like searching for the exact phrase because I kept putting the word kept in Passover and it only showed me one spot. Okay. They kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So did the children of Israel. Um, now there were certain men that defiled the dead body. Um, the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses, they were, who were defiled by the dead body of the man, pardon me. Um, so they had touched a dead body, and this would be uh, something that you have to do when someone dies. So um, they ended up having to uh, not be able to keep the Passover. So they're going to give them the Passover in the second month. So in the 14th day of the second month. And so it says, uh, but the man that is clean and is not on a journey, and forbear to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among the people. So, so there is, you need to keep the fat Passover in the first month. It's not like you just have a choice. You can keep it one month or the other. But if you're not able to keep it in the first month, you can keep it in the second month. Now, um, we know that in Second Chronicles chapter 2, or chapter 2, Second Chronicles chapter 29, you're going to have this uh, situation where they're going to have this second Passover when Hezekiah cleans the, the temple, right? The priests and the Levites clean. And then they're going to have this uh, offering in the second month and they're going to invite, uh, or the Passover in the second month, and they're going to invite Northern Israel to this Passover that Hezekiah has. So, <clears throat> So there's a couple of points that I'm looking at. I don't want to confuse people here, but we know that when the manna falls, it's going to occur on the 16th day of the second month in the year that they come out of Egypt. <clears throat> so I'm going to address all these different points. So maybe we'll look at it this way. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Is this the one I want? This one. <clears throat> hmm. This is the one. Okay. Now, if people aren't following what I'm talking about, or you have questions, just please ask. <clears throat> now, what we're looking at here, we, we got these dates on the bottom. This is May 27th, 1533 BC. That's the Julian date. <clears throat> and this is going to be May 5th, 1493. Again, the Julian date. And this is the number of days that, uh, that are, these are the dates that are given us. Uh, so we know that the manna is going to fall in 1533. So I'll go there first. <clears throat> it's going to be on uh, the Sabbath is going to be uh, the 15th day of the first month. 
And on the 15th day of the first month, they're going to be commanded, um, or, or first month, second month. Man, I'm, I'm trying to go too fast. I got to slow down. So this is in Exodus chapter 16, where they're going to, on the 15th day of the second month, that uh, Moses is going to tell them about the manna, right? And that they're going to gather it for six days. And then on the seventh day, they don't need to gather it because there will be enough. There'll be twice as much on the day of preparation, on the Friday. So they don't need to gather it on the Sabbath. So that's Exodus chapter 16. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking at here in uh, on this calendar converter is you're looking at the 15th day of the second month. So that's mentioned in... Exodus chapter 16. And then on the next day would be the first day of the week. So that's going to be the first day that they're going to gather. You can see it's a Sunday. Now, in this instant, they're not going to have a Passover on the second month. Remember, that's going to be in the second year that they leave Egypt. But if they did have a Passover, a second Passover, this would have been the wave sheaf offering. But it's it's not right because it's the second month, and and of course the wave sheaf offering is not. I don't think they have that. Of course, with the second month Passover, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that the structure here is you're going to have the sixteenth of the month, uh, which is a Sunday. The fifteenth is going to be on a Sabbath, and the Friday is going to be the fourteenth. Now. In the year that Jesus died on the cross, this is the same structure. You're going to have the 14th day being Friday, the 15th day, this is, of course, of the first month, being the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then you're going to have the wave sheaf offering on the Sunday. Anybody have questions about that? <clears throat> so we say the same structure here, though this is the second month. So that's all clear to everyone. <clears throat> now, this is one of the um, remarkable things about um, this chronology. Once we had worked out uh, the biblical chronology um, and we found that the Passover, um, well, the Exodus, the year of the Exodus, the one date we specifically had of the day of the week is this one. So in Exodus 16, verse 1, where it gives us that the, that the next day is going to be a Sunday, it doesn't tell us that explicitly, but it's definitely implied, then um, we now know that the 15th day of the second month is a Sabbath in the year that they leave Egypt. And so that eliminates many different dates many different years that people have often proposed for when the Exodus occurs. So, you know, people will have all kinds of different years, but none of these years that I've been able to look at that anybody has proposed actually take this into account. They don't look at which day is, uh, which day of the week, the 15th day of the second month is. Okay. Now, the other thing that's interesting then, when we go to 1493, so we're going to have to add here four years. So I guess simple way would be um, do this. Oops, I did that backwards. Anyways, can we do it wrong? No, that's not right. So I need 1493. Um, there we go. Oh, I should have known that. Uh, it's going to be. I'll just do it this way. I'll have to correct that. Okay, so 1493, and we're going to look at the day that the Passover are, occurs. So after they cross the Jordan River in 1493, uh, you're going to have this Passover. And it's going to occur on the 14th of Nisan, 
right? That's going to be May 3rd, 1493. And it's going to be a Friday. So just as the same month where they have this manna begin to fall, they're going to have this Friday in which um, th this is the last day they gather the manna, right? Because they're not going to gather the manna on Sabbath, right? So Sabbath, they're not going to gather manna. And then on the 16th of the month, after they had eaten the new corn of the land, right? So they are now keeping the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, it's going to be a Sunday. So this is going to be the last day of that period of time. Specifically, though, no manna falls. But you can see the same pattern. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread in 1493 is going to be on a Sunday. And it's going to be the morrow after the Sabbath. So when we look at Le Leviticus 23, um, <clears throat> it's going to talk about the Feast of First Fruits. And it says, um, speak unto the children of Israel. This is Leviticus 23, verse 10. And I got to share the screen so you can see this. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye be come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, there's an argument over this verse that is uh, the way that this has been interpreted interpreted um, by some Jews and some Christians is that the Sabbath here is referring to the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is the 15th day of the month. Um, and, and in that case, that means the wave sheave offering would be always fall on the 16th. And, and that's the correct way to understand it in some ways, except when you look at this word here in Hebrew, this is not referring to um, the, the weekly Sabbath, or, or, or pardon me, the, the 15th day. It's, it's referring to the weekly Sabbath. So when it says the morrow after the Sabbath here, it's talking about the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right? So it says, ye shall offer that day. When you wave the sheaf of the lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord, right? So this is going to be this wave sheaf offering. Now, and then in, in verse 15, it says, and ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So the important thing here is that we know from, from a study of scripture, that Pentecost is going to be um, 49 days, 50 days, depends how you count it, but 49 uh, cardinal days from the 16th day of the first month. That is, that's not going to be um, a different, it's with the, with the Karite Jews, the way they interpret this, is they say, since it's referring to the weekly Sabbath, that means the, the Feast of first fruits should always be on a Sunday. And then that means the day of Pentecost would always be on a Sunday. Now, when we look at the time of Christ, and we know that Jesus was crucified on a fr Friday, and that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a Sunday, and the Feast of first fruits was... Or, Day of Unleavened Bread was a Sabbath, and the Feast of First Fruits was the Sunday. It doesn't really help us here. That is, if we knew, you know, if it was during the week or something, then we, we would be able to see, okay, the Feast of First Fruits is always following the 15th. But because we don't have an example other than the one in, in the time of Christ, to mark that, at least most people don't think that we do, it doesn't settle the issue. But now when we look here and we've worked out this chronology, 
of the Feast of Weeks, that is the chronology of the Exodus, we know that the Feast of Weeks or, and also the, the wave sheaf offering are going to line up the same way they do in the time of Christ. So that means here um, that the Feast of Weeks is going to be on a Sunday. But this doesn't mean that it always falls on the Sunday. Because this is not giving a command for when you are to count the Feast of Weeks. In every situation, this is when they are going to count the Feast of Weeks when they first keep the Passover after crossing the Jordan River. Does that make sense to people? Because he specifically says, once you come into the land, here is what you're going to do. And you're going to do the wave sheaf offering on the morrow after the Sabbath. So that means ahead of time, God knows that the, that the when they come out of, when they cross the Jordan River and they come into the land, that the first Passover that they're going to keep, that, the, that they're going to have this first day after the Sabbath, that they're going to have this wave sheaf, sheaf offering, that it's going to be the 16th day of the first month. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, this would happen like that every year. Yeah, so it wouldn't be like that every year. It's only going to be this year that they're going to mark the Feast of First Fruits as being after the Sabbath. Now, once you have the Feast of First Fruits, Fruits marked, it's then going to continue to be on the 16th day of the first month. But nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that the Feast of First Fruits should be on the 16th day of the first month. Except here, the first time they keep it, it's going to be on the 16th day of the first month which happens to be the first day of the week. So there's no command that every time you keep the first fruit, feast of first fruits, that you would always mark it from the first day of the week. It's only here. And that's what they do. That's what they do every year, right? Some people. Well, the, the Karaite Jews mark it always on the first day of the week. So that means okay. they always have Pentecost on Sunday, but that's not correct. I see. It's not the correct way to do it. It's and because they take this verse here that talks about, well, you're supposed to have the feast of first fruits on the day after the Sabbath, but this is not in every instance. It's only here that the command is given when they come into the land. And so this is talking about the first time that you keep the feast of first fruits, it's going to fall on the on the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath. But it doesn't give any command about how to keep it after that. So you don't have any command about the Feast of First Fruits of, of which day of the week to keep it on or which date on in the month to keep it on. Now, once they keep the first Feast of First Fruits and it falls on the 16th day of the first month, this seems to be how they always kept the Feast of First Fruits. They didn't move it around within the month. They kept it on the same day of the month. But that's not what's being commanded here. They're just telling you when to keep it. It's going to be the morrow after the Sabbath, the first time. But it's not going to be the morrow after the Sabbath the next year. Instead, it's going to still be the 16th day of the first month. Now, the, one of the key verses here is Leviticus 23, 14. So it's going to talk about this, and it says, And ye shall, neither, uh, ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations 
in all of your dwellings. So what is this talking about? Because it's going to talk about waving the sheaf, right? So it's going to talk about the morrow after the Sabbath, etc. So it's, this is the Feast of first fruits. So what does it mean that until the self-same day? So what's self-same day refer to? We've dealt with this before. I don't remember. Okay, so we know they came out of Egypt on the self-same day that they, which is the 15th day of the first month. That's when they're going to travel. Um, so if it's the self-same day, that would be the self-same day, the day that they entered into Egypt would have been on the 15th day of the first month. So this self-same day shows up again and again. And it's referring to a day in a month. So if it's saying that this is the self-same day that you have brought an offering, is this not telling us that since it was on the 16th day of the first month, the first time, you're going to continue on the 16th day of the first month every time? That would look to be correct. Right. So hidden in this, this, this controversial passage in Leviticus 23, that has created a great deal of division amongst Christians, Messianic Jews and Jews. Um, we see here something about uh, uh, that if we don't understand the chronology of the Exodus properly, that we wouldn't be able to see this. So I think this is pretty remarkable. It's it's an important detail. That's they overlooked they overlook the self same day then by these right. people. Well, they've overlooked the self same day, but they've also overlooked the fact that this is going to be that the sixteenth day of the first month is going to be the first day of the week when they first enter into the land because many people don't have it that way they don't they don't even consider the week right but even if you look at other people's chronology and they have the chronology of you know which year the the exodus occurred and which year this would be it doesn't line up doesn't line up with the days of the week right so you don't have the 15th day of the second month beginning this time in which the, the man is going to fall. And you don't have the 16th day of the first month when they first keep the Passover falling on the first day of the week. But here in our chronology, we do. So this was an important detail um, that, you know, recently found out because Stephen's the one who counted the number of, of days that the manna fell. And so what we find is that the first time they keep the Passover, it's going to be the same days of the week that happens when Jesus is crucified. And that's pretty significant, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So as far as I know, no one else has ever noticed this. And, and this was one of these points of contention that that I've been aware of for about 40 years, um, which is kind of interesting because 40 years, that's the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. So for me personally, <laughs> it, it, it kind of lines up <coughs> with this. So, uh, so a huge issue. And um, yeah, it's probably been a little bit more than 40 years that I was aware of it. Uh, part of the way that I became aware of this, when I became um, a Sabbath keeper, I became a cat Sabbath keeper because I was uh, listening to uh, the radio and uh, to Herbert W. Armstrong. So I worked in a graveyard shift as a security guard. And so I'd listen to the radio and he was on and he started talking about, you know, the Sabbath. And I really started thinking about it. 
so I started studying um, about the Sabbath and I started keeping the Sabbath. But uh, Herbert W. Armstrong and um, he's he's got mixed up ideas about uh, the Passover and the timing of it, and because they keep the feasts, um, so. So that's when I first became aware of the issue. So that would have been like 1980, um, 1982 or something like that. Yeah, it was 1982 because I was, I was baptized December 25th, 1982. So I started keeping the Sabbath around this time uh, before I'd, I'd gone to the Adventist church. So, so that's about 40 years, kind of interesting. Um, anyway. So, so this point here, um, we were addressing in this chronology. So I'm just going to go back to this other chart that we looked at yesterday. And so one of the things that we see this 40 years from April 26, 1990 uh, to April 5th, 2030. And this 40 years, um, this date, this April 26 date was discovered. Uh, by looking at this November 24th, 2020 date and counting 11,900 11, days backwards uh, to this symbolic date of April 26, 1990. And so there was all these um, structures, the 168 days from November 9th, 1989. Um, and this number of days here, this is an exclusive count. This is the number of days that the manna from the 16th day of the second month in 1533 to the 16th day of um, the first month in 1493 BC. So that's the number of days. This is an exclusive count of days. That's why I have this E. If I have an I, it means inclusive. But I'm, I'm counting from the end of April 26, 1990 to the beginning of April 5th, 2030. And I do the same here from November 24th, 2022 to get the 2,688 days, and that's 16 times 168. And 168 is the number of hours in a week, so it's an important symbol. Um, and 16 would be the number of days that they cleanse the sanctuary, eight days for the priest, eight days for the Levites in uh, Second Chronicles 29. So, so pretty interesting. There's lots more to this structure that we looked at, but we were addressing um, these points because we've, if we go back to judges. So was that helpful for people? I know I, I, I still need to figure a better way to present it. Nobody has questions about what I had presented. Uh, the 14, uh, bottom one. The um, width? Yeah, the, what was that again? That number. 14,588 days. Yeah, that was, uh, what, where is that located at? So that is the number of days from, from that's 40 years less a month. Okay. So, so that's the number of days that from when the manna first fell, when they go out to gather the manna and there is no manna. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If we count an inclusive count, that is we count uh, an ordinal count from when the manna first falls to the last day, the manna falls, because it's going to fall on a Friday. It's first going to fall on a Sunday. It's 14,587 days. That is the 4th, 14,587th day that the manna fell from when it first fell is uh, 14,400 plus 187. So it's one tenth of 144,000 plus the symbol for July 18. Right. And that was the number of days from my conversion on August 11th, 1980 to July 18, 2020 was 14,587 days. So, which was you know, extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to connect. And there's other connections there because that's the falling of the stars on the day of my conversions. It's also August 11th. 
Um, so, so all these symbols are tied together. But we see this here again with um, this April 5th, 2030 date. And um, so we have this date coming up, November 24th, 2022, and April 5th, 2030. And we're not predicting any things on these dates. So we were addressing the ephod and saying that this ephod is a structure that um, is a stumbling block and it would be based upon chronology, that it would be time setting in our time using the chronology. And I'm suggesting that we can't use this chronology to, to set time, but we can measure the time. And the question was, you know, what is the difference between uh, the wait and see attitude of time will tell or the idea that, well, we put a date in the future and we don't know what it means, but maybe something will happen on that date. You know, maybe we'll understand it later. Maybe nothing will happen. What's the difference? <clears throat> So we talked about it, but any, anybody want to kind of comment on it? Because I don't want to be making an ephod that's going to become a stumbling block to Israel. I don't think any of us want to do that. Well, the comment <clears throat> that I was led to make yesterday was that this ephod was a type of a crutch. Yeah, it, was more, it was more reliant upon man than it, than it was upon faith in our creator. Okay. And, and it's a crutch in the sense that um, the motives of why it's being done. I mean, not that we can judge people's hearts. We can't look at their motives. But from what they've said... It's, you know, especially with the idea that time will tell, because the question is, if none of these things happen, what would be the conclusion that would be drawn for many of the people following uh, this, these predictions? Well, the reliance that they would have upon these predictions could lead them to a false sense of hope and a false understanding of what's going on rather than examining the history, the chronology, and the Bible. Okay. And so they're going to go back to, because when they take this ephod, it's going to be put in the house of Oprah. Right. So it's going to be put in his hometown. So the false worship that was being to be removed. Right. That right. was hindering, that was causing this in the first place, this strife, the Midianites, which symbolize strife or conflict. Um, they're going to be going back to that. So it's just going to create more conflict and more strife. Self is not going to be subdued. Correct. Okay. So now we address the death of Gideon. So in the death of Gideon, um, <clears throat> doesn't this, God say there's an appointed time? Yeah. Yeah, there is an appointed time. And it will speak. So there's lots of appointed times. The question is, can we know and predict those times? Can we know when Jesus is going to come back, for instance? There's an appointed time when Christ will return. Yeah, I'm not talking about Jesus coming back, but there's times. Right. So there are times that are appointed. All these way marks are appointed times. So, so these times are appointed. The question is, can we predict these dates in advance? 
Can we predict what events are going to occur on certain dates? And what we've learned from, from what our experience has been is that we can't because we haven't been able to predict anything yet, but also all of those dates were significant. So it's not like- doesn't, doesn't it say he reveals us things to mm -hmm. us? Yep. So he revealed all these dates to us. All these dates are correct, just as October 22nd, 1844 was correct. And, and we don't repudiate the dates. We don't reject them. We don't say, well, we got the wrong date because that's what happened to most of the Millerites after 1844. They said, well, we must have made a mistake. But of course, they didn't make a mistake with the date. The date was correct. The event was wrong. And this is the same with July 18th. We had the correct date. We had the correct structure. But it was in a structure of failed predictions. So God is trying to show us, because this is what I've been struggling with since 2018 when we first introduced time setting, is could we predict dates? Based upon what Ellen White said, I argued that... Um, we can only predict certain types of dates, but that we can't know what they mean until after. So we can measure the time. And after that, we can understand what the event is. So this is the position that I've taken. So I've taken, we have this chronology. We have November 8th, for instance, uh, that's part of this chronology going all the way to January 1st, uh, 2023, these 65 inclusive days. Um, that Colin has created in his structure. So we have this, um, uh, but the question then is, can we predict what's gonna happen on those dates? So Colin's made a prediction about what's going to happen in connection with the midterm election based upon chronology. But I believe that we can't know what, when things are going to happen. We can see the chronology and we know that it's typical, it's symbolic of what has been happening in this movement. And it's part of a chronology that's supposed to bring this movement together so that we can come to the upper room. It's not predicting when Trump is going to be reelected or when the Sunday law is going to occur. Didn't he show Nebuchadnezzar what's gonna happen in the future? Yeah. Well, that was future, right? Yeah, but he didn't give him the dates when those were going to happen. But even then, we have to remember that since October 22nd, 1844, Ellen White has had specific instruction regarding time setting. And, and we've gone through that. So... I've taken the position that she's, we don't disregard what she says. Parminder took the position, she's in a different dispensation, so it doesn't apply. She was only talking about her dispensation, but we're in a new dispensation in which we can now set dates. But Mr. White was talking about event, event setting with time. <clears throat> okay, so an event setting. Setting, setting <clears throat> events, events with the time, <clears throat> I right. thought. Yeah, so we can, we, can, we can know the time. That is, we can measure the time. But it's not until after things have, have happened that we can know that it was at the time. That is, we can't know what, those, what events are being marked ahead of time. Right. right. That's, that's the point that I have. So we look at the chronology. Odilio created some chronology, uh, an analysis of things that had happened. Um, and then Colin made a chronology of events that are still future. And I've also made a chronology of events that are, or of dates that are future, but I have no events attached to them. I don't know what November 24th, 2022 means. Now, after that date, we might see that it's, that it's significant. It is part of a structure of dates. So, 
those structures, lots of times dates within a structure aren't marking anything other than a symbol. So November 24th marks Thanksgiving, which is a symbol. It also is the, the 24th day of the 11th month. 11 times 24 is 264. So it has this other symbol. And then if we count 11,900 days back, we come to another symbolic date, April 26, 1990. So April 26 is that 26th day of the fourth month, the 264 symbol. So the question is why? Well, we don't know. All we know is that we have this structure. Now, we do know as we move, and this, this illustration we've used many times and Dwight used it, but as yesterday, but as we move towards our journey, we start to see these way marks. Now, when we see the way marks, we can tell we're on the right path, correct? Yeah, we see the road signs uh, pointing yeah. point to something. Yeah. When I was, you know, going over a mountain pass in the snow, when I couldn't see anything except the ground right in front of me, um, there happened to be little posts sticking up every 10 feet or so, you know, just a couple inches above the, the snow. So without those way marks, I wouldn't have been able to go over the mountain pass. So... So we have way marks that guide us. We have light for our feet. We don't have light that goes all the way uh, to the end of our journey, that we can see the end of the journey. We just have enough light for our feet. And so this is what God has been giving us, right, with all of this chronology. <clears throat> but if people start to say, uh, you know, we're arriving to this part of this journey ahead here. They're looking ahead further than the light is, and they're trying to predict what events are going to occur. I believe that God has been showing us that we can't do that. Now, we also have a date that's quite far into the future, you know, April 5th, 2030. So, you know, you're looking at something that's a little over seven years away. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, Jesus isn't coming back for another seven years? Are we to take these dates and sort of time set with them and say, well, you know, we now know we got seven years before we have to start worrying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what I've thought about <laughs> a couple times. <laughs> right, and but I don't think we should be thinking that way because we don't know what the right. date means. We don't know right, right. if it's marking some event. It could be marking the second coming of Christ, but the close of probation could be happening two years from now, right? You yep. know what I'm saying? So, so we don't know. We don't know what it's marking. It could, be, it could just be something that God has shown us as a symbol that we have more time because we need to do and accomplish a work. And, you know, this, all of these different symbols, I mean, when we go to, uh, I'm going to switch over here. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch back here. So that I'm just going to use this calendar here to, to look at, at Collins date. So remember, we're in 2022. And we have this election on November 8th, right? 2022. Now, what's the biblical date? That you see there. 813. Yeah, so 813 is significant because it's Daniel 813. It's part of the Fibonacci sequence, right? And the complement to 187. And the complement to 187. That is, if you add 187 to 813, you get 1,000, right? So it's, that's, it's like a, uh, I guess the complement is the best way to look at it, right? So it has all of these symbols attached to it. And, um, and then what 
what Colin's going to do is he's going to count 65 inclusive. Well, he's, he's, he does this at the beginning of his structure. So it's 65 inclusive days. But that means if we start at the beginning of November 8th, 2022, and we do this 65 days that comes from the prophetic mirror. So this is what Colin has done. Uh, it would, we would come to the end of January 11th, 2023. Right? And if we count from that date, um, the end of Jan January 11th, so that'd be January 12th, the beginning of January 12th, and we count 2,640 days, uh, we're going to come to that April 5th, 2030 date. So the 2640 is another symbol. And so that means Colin's structure that he has is tying us to this date that God has given me based upon all of these other measurements that I wasn't looking for, right? Wasn't looking for April 5th, 2030. It came from the week of Christ study where I first saw it. It came from looking at the 2300 months from the first day of the first month in 1844. Um, and it came also from the understanding of uh, 187 years and 20 months, um, which, which we can count from there as well. So we have all these symbols, right? Pointing to April 5th, 2030, but we have no event. But it's also tied to Colin's prediction. So Colin's prediction is based upon truth, right? That is, he's taken the chronology. He's taken this message of Gideon and he's seen the structure. That is, Gideon's message creates this ephod. Right? All right. But this ephod is being misused. That is, chronology is being misused when we start to predict that some event is going to happen on a future date. Because we're going to be wrong. Because God hasn't given us to do that in this time. And even when people set time in the past, they always got the wrong event, even if they got the right date. Millerites get the right date, but they don't get the right event. Yep. You think July 18th would have been a wake-up call? To know. the movement? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, you would think so. But, you know, if people aren't going to spend the time to examine the evidence. So, so we had a group of people that just rejected time setting altogether, right? Yeah, yeah. They would just went back, you know, basically to the world. Um, but then we had another group that said, well, we accept July 18th. We accepted that we were setting time correctly, and that's true. But we have two different approaches. One is, well, we can continue, continue setting dates, and one of these days we're going to get it right. Yeah, that's not good. And, and I don't think that's correct. No, because all of the evidence that we've had in all of our studies are showing us that these these dates that are being projected are part of this chronology. They're not wrong dates, but they're being used incorrectly. Now, I'm not really sure why uh, Gideon wanted to construct this ephod. Um, you know, he rejected being a ruler over them. But he, he still had them make this ephod. It, it doesn't really explain his thinking. Um, <clears throat> um, now, Ellen White, we've looked at the spirit of prophecy, what she said about Gideon. I can't remember specifically what she said about the ephod, other than what I see in the scriptures. Um, I'm just going to see, see, see what she says about it. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit here. So, let's okay. see screens. Um, yeah, so Gideon is, is going to take a wrong course. And, and so he thinks that he's a priest. Okay, so it says here, the people of Israel in their gratitude at deliverance from the Midianites proposed to Gideon that he become their king. 
in direct violation of the principles of the theocracy. So God is their king, right? God was the king of Israel. And for them to place a man upon the throne would be a rejection of their divine sovereign. Gideon recognized this fact. His answer shows how true and noble were his motives. I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. But Gideon was portrayed into another error, which brought disaster upon his house and upon all Israel. The season of inactivity that succeeds a great struggle is often fraught with greater danger than is the period of conflict. To this danger, Gideon was now exposed. A spirit of unrest was upon him. Instead of waiting for divine guidance, he began to plan for himself. Because he had been commanded to offer sacrifice upon the rock where the angel appeared to him, Gideon concluded that he had been appointed as a priest without waiting for divine sanction. He determined to institute a system of worship similar to that carried out, carried on okay. the tabernacle. Yep. Hold, hold for a second. Okay. While you're finding this in eternity past. Yeah. The source document is Signs of the Times, 28th of July, 1880. Okay, so let's go there. I know I just often just read the first one. So we're going to go to Signs of the Times. July 28th, 1881. Okay. And there's a reason that, that I'm asking you to do that. Yep. What you were just reading. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> Go, on. Go on. What you were just reading took out one word. Okay. From the original document. Now, as this, as this says, because he had been commanded to offer a sacrifice upon the rock where the angel appeared to him, Gideon concluded that he had been divinely appointed to uh, okay. officiate as a priest okay so let's go to it. it's it's uh july 28th what year 1881 signs of the times okay that's what i thought you said july one wrong step okay <clears throat> yeah so that we just read this part here and it says um God had manifested special favor to Gideon in selecting him as an instrument through whom to deliver Israel. While great responsibilities rested upon him in this important crisis, Gideon's course was marked with humility and faithful obedience. God accepted his work and crowned his efforts with success. But now Gideon was assailed with the temptation in a new form. When the reprover of wrong has done his work in obedience to God's commands, the period of inactivity which succeeds the struggle is often the most dangerous. This danger Gideon now experienced. A spirit of unrest was upon him. Hitherto, he had been content to execute the commands given him of God. But now, instead of calmly waiting for divine instruction, he began to devise and execute plans for himself. He had not learned to wait as well as to labor, to suffer God's will as well as to do it. Okay, so, now, yeah. Is this not what we're seeing within the movement after July 18th of 2020. Oh, yeah. This, this is exactly what we're seeing. Period of inactivity. <laughs> well, <clears throat> in this period of inactivity, just like what the Millerites experienced after October 22nd, 1844, there were those that wanted to remain active, setting new dates. And there were those that came away and said, no, we need to study and we need to come to a clearer understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. right i mean i mean that's that's a, an important point which, which is i think the whole point of all of this but so it says satan is never idle he is filled with hatred against god he is con and is constantly enticing men into a wrong course of action and so that's what we have to be careful about are we into a wrong course of action and what are our motives what is our thinking after the armies of the Lord have gained a signal victory, the great adversary is especially busy. He comes disguised as an angel of light, and as such, he endeavors to overthrow the work of God. Thus, thoughts and plans were suggested to the mind of Gideon, by which Israel were led astray. The tribes on the east side of the Jordan were quite a distance from the tabernacle of, at Shiloh, to which all the men of Israel were required to repair three times a year, 
to attend the great annual feasts. This, of course, required a considerable outlay of time and means. The thought was suggested to Gideon that it would be a great advantage to these tribes to have a place at home for sacrifice and worship. Without waiting for the divine sanction, he determined to provide a suitable place and to institute a system of worship similar to that carried on at the tabernacle at Shiloh. He had refused the urgent solicitations to become, the, become king of Israel, but now, but he now determined to take advantage of the popular feeling in his favor to carry out the plan he had devised. As his share of the spoil taken from the Midianites, he asked that all the earrings of gold might be given him, promising that he would put them to a wise use. As a natural, even at, as is natural, even at the present day, the people of Israel were more ready to ascribe the honor of the victory to Gideon than to the Lord. They readily complied with the request and also collected many other costly materials, together with richly adorned garments of the princes of Midian. The total value of the spoil thus contributed was not less than $15,000. From the material thus furnished, Gideon constructed an ephod and a breastplate of judgment in imitation of those worn by the high priest. Gideon led the people to look upon this ephod and the breastplate as possessing special sacredness in themselves. In this he erred. All that could make them sacred was the fact that they were employed in the solemn service of God, as he had directed. The high priest alone was authorized to wear them when he went before the Lord went in before the Lord. Because he had been commanded to offer a sacrifice upon the rock where the angel appeared to him, Gideon concluded that he had been divinely appointed to officiate as a priest and that by instituting a service there, he might save the people the trouble and expense of their journeys to Shiloh. The Lord was not pleased with this arrangement for it was contrary to the order which he had established. It was an assumption of authority on the part of Gideon which proved disastrous to himself and to all Israel. God designs that his people shall place a high estimate upon every provision, provision of, for their salvation. He desires them to appreciate his great mercy and condescension and to manifest gratitude and zeal proportionate to the value of the gift of the Son of God. But we are disposed to shun sacrifice and self-denial for our eternal interest while we readily devote time and strength to seeking temporal advantage. Thus, our conduct too often shows that we place a higher estimate upon earthly things than upon the heavenly treasure. Now, so the, the question why we looked at this was uh, Gideon's motives. So we know his motives were, um, they, they were sort of mixed, right? He obviously didn't want to become the ruler, the king. He understood that. But he believed that he was divinely appointed as a priest. And so he acted based upon his own, his own reasoning. And, and this is the thing that we have to be careful about. So we can see that this movement, this movement of July 18th, has this snare, and this has to be what we see presently. I, I don't see any other way to interpret this. It seems to be describing the situation that we're in. Now, as far as um, this worship, this worship that's set up in the place of the true worship, what would that represent? Well, okay. This, this worship is not according to God's appointed order. Mm -hmm. And we just read that, correct? Yeah. Now, just as the article pointed out, who was to wear the ephod? The high priest. When was he to wear the ephod? Um, well, when he went in before the Lord. Right. Now, Gideon was taking the thought that in constructing this ephod, he had now been divinely appointed as a priest and that he could then go in before the Lord 
he was not in Shiloh. Mm -hmm. He was not in the tabernacle and he was definitely not in the most holy place. Right. So isn't this similar to a lot of the things that we're seeing right now? I mean, this kind of a, a worship has elements of truth, but is not the whole truth. Okay. Okay, well, let's look at it in um, maybe maybe unkind way. I don't know the way to say it, but when we look at what's happening with the American group and the Canadian group, so they've set themselves up as the, the worshipers of truth. Of truth. Yeah, and, and that they're, they, they have the Sabbath, right? I mean, they have a Sabbath school in church, right? So they're the church, right? Would, would be, that be how we see what they're doing? I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. And, and I have taken the position that we shouldn't try to fight against them in that sense, that we're not going to have meetings when they're having meetings. Um, and why, why would I not do that? Why wouldn't I just say, well, they're wrong, I'm right. It would call, it cause even more disunity if you do that. Okay. But yeah. you're, you're also choosing to respect God's order. Right. So God's order is what at this time? That we are to wait, and in waiting we are to also be studying. Yeah. So we're following the counsel that Ellen White gave that they followed after October 22nd, 1844. Right. So they studied together. They needed to understand the reason for their disappointment. And they waited for God's direction. <clears throat> and so we could move ahead. We could decide, OK, all these people are wrong. You know, let's just start our own group let's let's start organizing and planning um you know what we're going to do but i think that's wrong i think that what we have to do is wait upon god and that god will have his time that he will bring these events about so that people can be restored because if we if we take this position if we take the idea that we're the priests that we're the ones you know that we can wear the ephod so to speak um, then we're we're doing the same thing uh, that happens here in the story of Gideon. And we can't do that. God has a purpose and a plan, and we need to study and try to understand what's happening. But we can't take things into our own hands. And And I couldn't do it in the sense that if I took things into my own hands, can I have confidence in what I'm doing? Because our confidence is in what God is doing. And, and I, I can't quite understand why people would, how they can actually sort of disregard God's instruction and still feel confident. I don't think I could do that. You understand what I'm saying? At this point, if we have confidence in what we are doing, we are then placing ourselves above the way that God is leading us. Mm -hmm. Now, we are shown from Scripture that those that were fully reliant upon God, such as Elijah, such as Moses, such as Ezra, did not walk according to the sparks of their own kindling. When you get into trouble, as Peter did, he began to walk according to his thoughts, 
And it wasn't until after the resurrection that he began to understand how foolish that had been. Mm -hmm. No, we don't want to make the same mistakes that people have made in the past. We want to look at, at, and that's why I think, you know, all these dates are given us is one is they guide us. They help us. They correct us as far as I can see. And they give us confidence that God is leading and that they're not created by man. Man isn't in charge here. God is in charge. And that we need to wait upon God. We need to watch and wait. Watch and wait to me is the same as measuring the time. Right? Looking at the way marks. But when we start to predict, you know, that the Sunday law is going to come or Trump's going to be reelected. I, I think we're taking our our eyes off of Christ and placing them upon man. We're we're trying to find what we want, not what God wants. To me, when God leads, it's, it's very clear. Does not God give us the privilege to prophesy? I think <clears throat> you have to be very clear in the situation. In order to prophesy, the Holy Spirit needs to be poured out. If the Spirit is not being poured out, there's a problem. Because the prophecy is going to come through him, through the Holy Spirit, and not through man. Can you hear me? I can hear you right now, yeah. Okay, yeah. So my other computers, for some reason... Uh disconnected from the internet but my internet's fine because this computer is fine so well, let's deal with some of this uh writing it on a board here so iran's recording this too i'm obviously not recording this part of it So if we're going to take a look at um, these lines, and we're going to deal with Gideon himself, so this message. Uh, where do we have this message of Gideon begin? Where did we start it? Would it have been just before July 18th? Okay, well, remember we had the separation of the previous message. So the previous message, the previous judge was Deborah and Barak, right? Correct. So we had the message of Cicero. And we're going to have that ending in connection with September 7th, uh, 2019 to November 9th, 2019, right? That's 63 days in there, right? Okay. Okay. And... Um, So it's going to be in connection with November 9th, with this period of time, that the message of July 18th is going to be revived. So this would have to be where the message of Gideon begins. Now, the enemy is the Midianites, right? The Midianites is strife. So do we have strife here in the movement? Yes. Okay, so we have strife there. And um, <coughs> this, um, this, this strife is going to continue because we have the one group leave, but we're still going to have this antagonism that's occurring within the movement here. So even though July 18th is, is accepted, 
we still have these conflicts that are going on. So then we're going to have, of course, July 18. So what is July 18 marking in the story of Gideon itself? Because is this going to be the battle against the Midianites where the Midianites are defeated? How do we, how would we take Mark, July 18th itself as a way mark in the story of Gideon? Okay, what about the 300? Can we put the 300 here? Sounds good. Okay. Because that's basically where Jeff places it. This is the whittling down. And so you're going to have a 300. These are the people that are going to accept July 18th, right? not literally a number 300 but it symbolizes it and we know that 300 is also connected to uh, March 27th right because this number 273 is also connected to 300 happens in numbers chapter 3 and Ellen White's reference to the 300 on the ship which is 276, but she just calls it 300. So, so we have this symbol here. We also have, of course, um, the pandemic itself. So how does the pandemic fit in with the story of Gideon? And, of course, it starts here. Uh, specifically for me, it actually starts on March 27th because that's where the 100 days of prayer begin. That's where I first get laid off because of the pandemic. So March 27th, 20. Yeah. So if we're going to apply the pandemic in there, isn't, isn't that a type of a separation? Well, we would say the pandemic's the type of the Sunday law. And so we've always taught that this battle against the Midianites and the children of the East and all those people that come in um, is the Sunday law, right? So this pandemic, you know, I put here that it starts, but it's, I mean, it starts in connection with November 9th, but March 27th is also connected because that's when it impacts us the most is at this time with the 100 days of prayer. So, um, I mean, the Sunday law shows a separation. So there's a separation happening here. We have November 9th. We have the pandemic come in. But we have a group that now is going to proclaim July 18th. So, I mean, we could put June 21st, June 22nd in there as well. But this is where this separation happens. Right? It's we're whittled down here during this time of the pandemic. Now, how much did the pandemic help in our confidence in July 18th, for instance? Elder Jeff referred to it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And we know that he had predicted this, right? There's a whole bunch of chronology right. that. Because there's, um, uh, from the time of the pandemic um, prediction, so Jeff made this prediction January 14th, 2017. There's a period of 1,260 days, and there's also a period of 1,533 days, um, which the 1,260 is a part of. And we know 1,260 plus 273 is 1,533. Um, so we had counted these dates. I can't remember specifically. There's a, 
um, dates involved here, though. Um, just can't remember the actual dates. <clears throat> I could probably figure it out. But but anyway, we have this pandemic, and we have so the story of Gideon isn't just one story, right? There's the story first of, and if we want to look at it, the first part of the story has to do with this false teaching. And that is, there's time setting that's being used incorrectly by Parminder's group. They're opposed to July 18th, but they're still time setting, right? They're looking to November 9th, 2019, based upon a dispensational argument. So we have a false system of study, um, false methodology, I guess we could call it, because that's the term they used, methodology, and which of course was completely false. It was this whole idea of, you know, trusting in these teachers, in these men. Right? No, that's not right. Just doesn't look right. Anyway. Um, and so you're going to have that, uh, the altar being torn down, right? You're going to have the sacrifice. So that, that, that sacrifice, we're going to see it, it, it relates to, um, to this message, to the seven times, all these different things that, that it, cause it's seven years old or something, right? So we can see all of these things are leading to this, this part of the movement. So the story of Gideon's gonna begin here and, and it happens in these different stages. First part, tearing down the altar, the altering of the offering of the sacrifices, the signs that are given. I mean, specifically, um, we remember he had this prophecy about what was going to happen. What was the prophecy about? What, what was the message that was given that Gideon was basing his prayers on? Why he was asking God? What was he asking God about? Because isn't September 7th a sign? Right? Because remember September 7th at noon? I count back. I also count these 63 days. 7 times 9 is 63. But I count back to October 13th, and I find a chiastic structure in which March 27th, 2019 is the center of that structure. Right? Right. Yeah. So there's there's a whole bunch of things that happen for me to understand here on September 7th that we are on the right track. So there's this sign. And there's also a prophecy that Gideon refers to. What was being prophesied? I don't have my Bible right here in front of me. So because it's on the computer screen over there. <clears throat> Okay, our time is almost up here, so let's just go back here in um, so it's verse eight, Judges six, verse eight. The Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of that all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Right? And then we get the call of Gideon. So the call of Gideon is going to be attached to these signs, right? The fleece, also the offering that's being uh, burnt up that he puts on the rock. So how did we how did we attach these? What did we attach these signs to?
is something being given this movement that is going to guide it. I believe it's something like a message that's going to, to guide the movement. Yeah. So, so we need to do this. Tomorrow we'll try to get this all on the line, the whole story of Gideon, all on the line, and marking out the dates that I believe are marked by these different events, what symbols are being given to us. So it's something to think about for tomorrow. Okay. All right. Now, um, okay. So I'm back here on this other computer just to close. So sorry about that, that we had that little diversion, but it was probably good because it caused us to draw some of these things on a line. Um, So when we come back to this tomorrow, the things that I want you to think about is this whole story of Gideon. How can we draw this on the line? So I want you to think about that, um, where we would place all of these events. What is the prophet's message? How would we interpret that? What part of the message is this? Um, what do these different things mean that are being given to Gideon? Okay. So we can now close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study uh, this morning for each person who's searching for truth. We pray for this movement. We know that uh, the struggle that people face in trying to understand what is right and what is wrong, that it's not always easy. But we know, Lord, that you present light to us and that um, you give us more light as we follow the light that we have. Help us to be faithful to the things that you have shown us and um, help us to be merciful to those around us. Help us to not follow in the same errors as those before us, but to learn from their mistakes. Be with us now throughout this day. May your angels watch over and care for each one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.